I want to get right into this. Let's get to work here. We have a new series called, just simply called, The Holy Spirit. And this is a five-week series, and I'm going to ask you to, like, maybe can, this might be one of those series you want to commit to, even if you can't make it every week, to go to the archive and, and, re, and, and follow along with, with the weeks that we're doing this. And I want to take you through what the Bible says, but I need a favor from you. Because I know when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I know a lot of us, we have a lot of preconceived ideas about who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, and how he manifests and shows up in people's lives. And let me just ask you to do me a favor. If you would, for the next five weeks, give me a blank slate. I'm going to ask you just to you know, erase everything you've learned about it, and let's just find out what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and how he operates and how he functions in our life. Because we have preconceived ideas about who he is and what he does. A lot of them, a lot of our ideas are based upon what other people do and what other people have said about him. And I just want to throw this out. I'm not trying to uh, start anything with anybody here, but if someone is, is, who's spirit-filled is weird, can I help you out with something? The Holy Spirit didn't make them weird. They were weird already. <laughs> if you find a Christian who says, oh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a weird Christian, can I help you? They were, we- they were a weird non-Christian, okay? And, and, that, and that's sort of, I want you to know that. Here's, because here's my thought. I have a hope for you. I, and I'm sincere in saying this. I, I, here's my goal. And whenever I write a series and, and I bring my team and I write with them and I sit with them, I say, what do we, what do we want to accomplish in this series? Like, what, what's our purpose and, and, I, and I don't always tell you that because I, I, sometimes I hide it and show it at the very end. But I'm going to let you know exactly what we're about in this series is that, that you will want to know the Holy Spirit and be close to him. That you would want to know him and be closest to him. My thesis is this. If you are afraid of him, it's because you don't know who he really is. But if you understood him, you would want to be close to him. If you really understood who he is, you would want it, the Holy Spirit in your life. And we don't even like the word, because some translations use the word Holy Spirit. Others use Holy Ghost. People don't like ghosts or spirits. I know that. And so we've got to overcome a lot on the front end. And this is a five-week series that I think if you'll give me a blank slate and, you, and you'll let the Bible formulate your beliefs, I really truly think that you'll embrace the Holy Spirit in your life. And this is nothing new. You all know in the book of Acts, well, let me set it up for you. There's the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're basically um, the story and the life of Jesus. They're written from four different perspectives. Different people have different perspectives of each story. And it really just basically uh, tells what happened in the life of Jesus from his birth to his death. Well, then there's the book of Acts. And um, the book of Acts is, of all the, the books in the New Testament, it's the most historical. It's an historical account of the early church. And it, it shows up right after Jesus died. And in fact, in Acts chapter one, when you go there, it starts off with really the Holy Spirit being revealed to the early church. Well, that was written in about 30, they say about 33 AD, 30 AD, somewhere in there. Well, I'm gonna take you to the book of Acts chapter 19 this morning. And that was written in A.D. 54. And so that's about probably 22, 24 years later when this was written. And here we go, Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. It says, well, Apollos was in Corinth. Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus, which is now uh, modern-day Turkey. He said on the coast where he found several believers. So he found people just like you and me sitting here. And he said, "Did did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe?" So he said, hey, you're believers. Jesus is your Lord. But did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. And no, they replied, like, like, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And I think that's where a lot of us are today. Like, like, yes, God. Yes, Jesus. But who's this Holy Ghost? Who's this Holy Spirit? Who, 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 who is this? And I think a lot of us, we struggle with, with, with the question, and I get it. That's why I want to take my time and do five weeks on this. I think we're going to start off by answering the question is, who is he? Who is the Holy Spirit? Like, what's his role and what is his function in our life? He's not a cosmic, mystical force. He's not a cloud. He's not a it. He's not a thing. He's not a mist. And, it, and, and the Holy Spirit 
is the third person, the Godhead. We're going to talk about that. And, and, and the reason this is so hard for us is the Bible was written, as you know, in, um, in Hebrew for the Old Testament and primarily in Greek for the New Testament. And uh, there's a lot of words that come from the Bible that we don't have an English word for. It's called a transliterated word. Like, like for the word uh, baptize, it, we have the word baptize. It comes from the Greek word baptizo, which at, we know what to be baptized is. You, you were baptized in water. Well, it comes from a Greek word baptizo, which we didn't have a word for because the, the definition of that word means to dip, to die. And so it'd be like John the Baptist, John the dip. How about that? And um, it wouldn't go over so good, would it? And so John, John, it means to die. And so they came up with the word just baptized. Well, with the word Holy Spirit, I'm going to cut into this next week. But it, in the Greek, it comes from the word spirit, comes from the word pneuma. And it means a breath of fresh air. It means a blast of wind. It, means, it literally means the, the breath of God. And so there's really... They haven't been able to find a good translation for that word. And so they just put in there that it is the spirit. He says his words are spirit. It, it, Jesus said his, God's words are spirit and life. It's pneuma. It means it's alive and it's fresh. And so I want to talk about who he is. Now, how I want to do this is I want to take the words of Jesus if you go through John, in the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, 15, and 16, there's three chapters there. And it's right before Jesus goes to the cross. And he's having this conversation with the disciples. And he's talking about, hey, I'm going to leave. I'm going to be out of here. But don't be concerned. I'm going to send someone to, to you that's going to be better than me, actually. And they really struggled with this. His introduction of the Holy Spirit. So if you want an in-depth study of who the Holy Spirit is, his function and his role, read John chapter 14, 15, and 16, because that's really when Jesus introduced is who the Holy Spirit is. Number one, if you're taking notes, I'll tell you who he is not. Number one, he's not an it, he is a him. The Holy Spirit is, now why is this so important, everybody? Because you can't have a relationship with an it. You can't have a relationship with a thing. I know some of you have a relationship with your phone right now. I get it. But here's, here, let me tell you how this works. When that, if you lose your phone or someone steals your phone, they'll take your SIM card out and they'll put a new SIM card in. And guess what? Yeah, your phone won't, won't even remember who you were. And the, why is this so important that the Holy Spirit, because we've made him into an it, a dove. We've made him into a cloud, some mystical force. And he's not an it, he's a him. This is key for us. Because you can't have a relationship with a, it. You have a relationship with real people, a him. And he's the third person of the Godhead. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 14 when he's introducing the Holy Spirit. He's talking about, I'm going to leave. I'm going to take off, guys. And they said, no, you can't. He said, no, listen. And I will pray when I leave to the Father, and he will give you another helper. Notice this language, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit, the pneuma of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither, notice, notice this language, sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. It's really important for you to know that he is not an it, he's not a thing, he's not a cloud, he's not a mist, he's a him. That's how Jesus described him. Somewhere along the way in the modern church, we've turned him into a symbol. And he, that's not who he is. Number two, it's important for you to know this, that he is not weird. I, I want you to know that, that the Holy, come on, the Holy Spirit is not weird. He is God with you. And I, I get it because, listen, I, I grew up in a church and, and they were introducing the Holy Spirit. We, we were raised in a certain denomination and then my parents got born again. We went to a church kind of like this and here's my takeaway from it is if, 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 if you were filled with the Holy Spirit, had the Holy Spirit in your life, then you couldn't wear makeup. And then I started watching Christian television and they wore too much makeup. <laughs> and you know what my takeaway was is this. If you had this Holy Spirit thing, you're, I'm gonna have to marry someone ugly. Because that's how extreme they were. And that was just two extremes. But again, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be crass. But honestly, if you're weird with the Holy Spirit, you were weird before the Holy Spirit got involved in your life. 
And, and, and that's just the reality of it. John chapter 16, Jesus said it like this. He said, but in fact, it's best for you that I go away. And they struggle with that thought. Like it's, like it's best for you. Why? Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. Not, not the weird one of the group. But the advocate won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. He's an advocate. He's there to help you. He, you need to know he is not weird. Another thing you need to know is this. is He is God. He is God. And that, like that's important for us because I think a lot of us accept Jesus as God. We accept God as God. But this Holy Spirit, I don't, I, I don't know about him being God because it, we, we, we accept two parts of the Godhead but not the third part of the Godhead. And the Bible doesn't delineate classes in the Godhead. Let me show you. In Acts chapter 5, there's this story of this couple named Ananias and Sapphira. You know the story. If you, if you know church history, it's this couple and they, they sold some land and they brought their money to the church and they were going to give to the church and they lied and they said they're going to give all the money, but they kept back part of the money, which isn't a problem at all for God. You're going to find out. He doesn't mind. If you want to give part, that's fine. If you want to give some, you want to give a lot, a little, that's not the issue. The issue was is they, they said they sold it for this amount and they, they gave all of it. Well, they lied. They didn't sell it for that amount. And here's the story in Acts chapter 5. It said, then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit. You kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wish. In other words, that's not the issue. Like whether you gave or didn't give, that's not the issue. He said, but you lied to the Holy Spirit. After selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us. Notice this language, but to God. Here it says the Holy Spirit. At the end it says you weren't lying to us, but God. What am I saying, everybody? Is the Holy Spirit is God. There's, there's, no, there's no distinguishing issue there. The, God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. And so I, I get it, because people, we, we're about 15 years old. We've been here, and when we first came, we didn't know anybody at all, and so so good to see all of you here today. And uh, when we first came, we had two people come to our first service, and, and over the years, you know, our church has a reputation that we are a church, non-denominational church, that we reach the lost, but we are a spirit-filled church, where this is a church where the this, this spirit-filled is, and when people go, well, you know, that East Coast believers, they're spirit-filled over there. I know why they say that, I because I, I hear that sometime when I run into people, they're they're sort of saying it in a negative connotation, almost like, I mean, you just never know what's going to happen over there. They don't do things in excellence. They don't do them in order. They're kind of strange, and they're kind of weird. And, and, the, and the reality of it is when they say spirit-filled, there's sort of a negative connotation that goes with it, like you just don't know what's going to happen over there. And the reality is, if the spirit is God, the truth is, we could, we could be saying it's a God-filled church over there. It's not just full of the Spirit. It's full of God. It's, it's, it's a God-filled, full of God. And, and God mo- it's not just the Spirit moves, everybody, but God moves at East Coast Believers Church. Because, you know, here's the truth. I, t- I was meeting with our staff, and I was laying out our 2020, and I, something popped out of my mouth, and it was so good Dina recorded it. And it's this. We can't let people come to church looking for God and only find good messages. We can't let them come to church looking for God and only find a good-looking pastor here. You know, no, I'm just kidding. And, or, or good music. We, when people come to church, we got to let them find God, everybody. And, and you, you can't distinguish the Spirit from God. They are the same. Now, if your idea of what a Spirit-filled church and a Spirit-filled believer looks like is strange or weird, then you've based the, your, your thoughts on what television preachers have done instead of what the Bible says. You've based your thoughts on really maybe a bad, I get it, because I've had those myself, a bad experience. Here's, it's so important, and I'm gonna wrap up this series on this verse, but the benediction of 2 Corinthians 13 reads like this. It's the amazing grace of the master. His, his, his benediction to the, to the Corinthian church. It's the third, it's the second Corinthians, but it's the third letter he wrote. The amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God. Notice this. In the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit, 
be with you all. He said, hey, it's good to know the grace of Jesus. We all need his grace. I mean, you, you need to know the love of God in your life. But you know what else you need? You need the friendship of the Holy Spirit in your life. Here's the thing, fourth thing who he is according to scripture. The, he is my friend. The Holy Spirit is not, not just supposed to be something that happens in a service. He, he actually is my friend. And I think all of us, we have weird friends. The Holy Spirit's just not one of those. And, and again, if you're, if you're basing your belief on this friend, this Holy Spirit, based on Christian television, I, I just want to say this humbly, you've maybe been misguided because that's really not who the Holy Spirit, think about it. The early church, the Bible says they turned the world upside down. They changed the world. How do they do that? By the Holy Spirit. And, and the reality, who do you think would come in, because of any topic, one that brings the most division and strife and sort of, and sort of confusion is this topic right here about the Holy Spirit. And he's supposed to be our best friend. Who do you think would bring in that sort of division and that sort of challenge and issues? It's, it's the devil would do this. And so this is sort of the theology of what Jesus said. I just took, I just took John 14, 15, and 16 and just sort of looked through it and, and found some characteristics of who the Holy Spirit is. He's, he's a him. He's not weird. He's God, and he's my friend. Now, let me just in the next 18 minutes I have left with you, I want to get real practical, and I want to show you the benefits of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit will do in your life if you'd give him the freedom and the opportunity to be your friend. It's really important that you know this. Well, just one thought today, and that is this. The Holy Spirit is not for looks. He's for use. We've turned him into the modern Western church. We've turned him into sort of a title. You're, you're non-spirit-filled, you're spirit-filled. I don't even like the title, Full Gospel Church. And, and the reason I don't like that is because it almost by implication means that, are you ready, that, that, that we think you're part gospel and we're all gospel. And, and can I just tell you, I don't know many pastors out there today that maybe have different churches that think that they're half gospel. And, and what I want you to hear from me, East Coast believers, hear this from your pastor with a heart of humility. When you... When we talk about the Spirit of God in life, when we communicate with other people, we don't think we're better than anybody else. The Holy Spirit doesn't make us better than any other church. The Holy Spirit doesn't make us better than any other Christian. He just makes us better than ourselves. He just removes some limitations out of your life. We've got to communicate this message with this heart, everybody. Because the, the world is, the church is tired of churches that, who think that they're better than anybody else. Come on. And I, you need to hear it from me. I don't think East Coast Believer Church is better than any other church in our town. We're just one church doing what God's called us to do. But the Holy Spirit is not for looks. He's for use. And we've turned him into sort of a title. I know in our house now, uh, and I learned this when I first got married, there are things in my house that I'm not allowed to use. <laughs> I pay for them, but I don't use them. Let me explain to you what this means. When I first got married, I'll never forget this. We were married less than a year. I come, I wash my hands in the sink in our bathroom, and I walk over to the towels that are hanging on the towel rack, and I go dry them off. I know, that's what Dina did. She goes, what are you doing? I said, I think I'm drying my hands. She goes, no, those towels aren't for you. They're for looks. I said, well, they're hanging in our bathroom. And so I love this. So I learned at a very early age in our marriage that I don't, you, you get to use them. No one will say a word to you about it. We'll even, if you come to our house, we'll clean them before you come. And you can use them, but I can't. And I remember just about, just about probably about 10 years ago, I never forget, one of my, my son, he was coming out, he's in the bathroom, and he walked into the, and he went to the bathroom, washed his hands, and he walked over the town, he used them. I said, rookie mistake, rookie <laughs> He says, what? I said, wait, just wait, 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 it's coming. She walks, it's rookie mistake. We don't use, you use them, we don't. Same, hey, listen, here's the same thing with our comforter. I, when we first got married, I was going to bed just a couple weeks, we know, on our honeymoon, came back first, night home, and I put, put the comforter, pull it up, and she goes, Dana goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to bed using the comforter. She says, oh, no, we don't use that comforter. 
I says, what do you mean? She goes, it's just for looks. She says, I'll get you a blanket you can use if you want to stay warm. You know what I'm saying? We've negotiated, we're 25 years, we've negotiated, everybody, I got some good news for you. I can, I can use the comforter now. It costs a lot more than our first one, but I can use it. But so there are things, you all, you know this, there are things that you can't use that they're just for looks. Well, the Holy Spirit, he's not just for looks, he's for use. There are some benefits to making him your best friend. There are benefits to the friendship of the Holy Spirit in your life. John chapter 14, here we go. He said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you, notice this language, another helper. And the Amplified sort of describes what that helper looks like, a comforter, an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a strengthener, a standby, to be with you forever. If you're taking notes, I'd write this thought down. The Holy Spirit, he is my helper. And, and can I just, can I be honest with you? I know how to do church. I understand how to do church. And I know, I know how, the, how, I've been doing this long enough to know, well, I know when, how long to preach. I know how to make people laugh. I know how to make people cry. I, I, I know how to do all that. I know how to assemble a team together. But in the midst of all this, can I just tell you this? I find myself often wondering, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. I, really, I rely on the help of the Holy Spirit. And all the things that are going on in my life, and in people's lives. I think one of the, people ask me, what about pastoring? Is it hard? And it's really, it's really not. I love pastoring and I enjoy having the best time of my life. I think you walk in a grace, but one of the most difficult things of pastoring is when you have to walk through the pain in people's lives. They make the poor choices and you gotta be there for them. And you think about it and, and you walk through. In fact, this year, my 21 days of prayer and fasting, this is the first time ever. I didn't, I, I asked God, I said, what? I just didn't really need anything in my life. And so this whole 21 days, I've been praying for you. In fact, the last week of the 21 days, I prayed specifically that you'd get closer to God this year than ever before. And I remember we end, we end our 21 days with, with this, what we call our prayer of agreement service, which we do first Saturday prayer every month. But the prayer of agreement after the 21 days is a time where everyone brings their list of things that they're praying for. They bring them up here, and the pastors, myself, and our team, we meet up here, and our other location comes in for that. It's just awesome. My favorite prayer service. It's very, very powerful and very holy. And I remember I was just, I was standing right about here, and um, this family came up, and they had their list, and I was going to pray with them about it. And, and, and the thing on their list, the main thing was one of their children was going through something. And, and so, so I kneeled down, and I said, can I pray with you, buddy? And I kind of held him like that, hugged him, and I prayed over him. And I just prayed a prayer that came to me by the Lord. And I looked up, and the, and the parents, and they were just moved. And so I said, is everything okay? And they said, yeah, yeah, but, 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 but you just prayed. Who told you that? I said, who told me what? And they said, you prayed that the Spirit of God would hover over them. And I said, well, yeah. I, like, like, did I, do so I thought, did I do something wrong? And they go, no, that's the verse God gave us to stand on. And, and guys, he's my helper. Can I just tell you, I need help. Here's what the scripture says. And in a similar Romans 8 way, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us and our weakness. I mean, we, we, we have some weakness that we need to be empowered. For example, at times we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for. But the Holy Spirit rises up within us. I love, what a beautiful verse. I love the language here. To super intercede in our behalf, pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. Isn't that awesome? Second thing, the Holy Spirit, a benefit of it, is he will reveal the Bible to me. He'll make the Bible come alive. And one of the things I would say to you, and, and I think it's great to start off reading your Bible out of discipline, but somewhere along the way, what I hope is it would turn from duty to delight. And if you're just reading, and I, and I get it, if you're just reading out of discipline, keep doing that. And, and I challenge you, give God the first 15, five minutes in the word, five minutes in prayer, and five minutes of worship, and it'll change your walk with the Lord this year. But... Guys, can I tell you, the Bible is not meant just to be read. It's meant to be consumed. 
And the Holy Spirit wants to talk to you through it. Jesus said it like this in John 14. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will remind you of everything I said to you. When you're reading your Bible, the Holy Spirit will start talking to you. If you give him that freedom in your life, your best friend will say, hey, this is how you handle that situation. Or, or he knows something about your future that you don't even know about. That he'll make a scripture come alive off the page. Why? He's your best friend. Third thing the Holy Spirit will do to you for you is he will convict me of sin. Convict me of sin. And, and I know there's two words there that we just hate to hear. These two words, we don't want to hear them. Convict and sin. Well, let me help you out with these words. Number one, the word sin means to miss the mark. The word convict, if you think about it, think it really means to convince more than anything. We, we assume, we, we kind of put it together with sin and we mean it's the Holy Spirit's going to get on to us. And can I help you out with something about sin? This really helped me out as a young person. God doesn't hate sin because it's fun. He hates it because it hurts you. He's, he, he doesn't want you hurt. God's not opposed to having fun and enjoying. He, he said, I, I created this earth for your pleasure. Like he wants to. He just, he just wants to make sure you're not hurting other, other people in your life or you're not getting hurt. You know why God likes to keep intimacy inside of a marriage? The same reason, hear, hear me, the same reason you like to have a fire in a fire pit. Because if it's contained for what it's meant to be contained in, it'll bring warmth and it'll be a blessing in your life. If it gets outside of the fire pit, it'll destroy you. God doesn't hate sin because it's funny. He hates it because it hurts you. So that word sin, don't think of it in a negative word. Convict means to convince. Like he wants to convince you of this. I remember when Dean and I, when I, when I first saw Dina, man, I was really head over heels, you know, and I just thought she was all that. And uh, I tried to date her, and she didn't want anything to do with me. And I had to, guys, I had to convince her that I was worthy. It took me a year and a half, because you know what I learned? Persistence wears down resistance. You know, and we, and we even, even when we were getting married, I kind of set it up for her and I painted the best picture I could. I, I put on the best sale I could of what her life was going to be like. And I overperformed. And I'm just kidding. And, uh, but my, my point is, is I had to convince her. No one would think that was wrong. Let me help you out with something. He will convince me when I miss the mark because he loves you. Here's what the scripture says. And when he comes, he will convict the world about sin about righteousness and about judgment. And which, when you read that verse, you go, I don't even know, what, what does that even mean? Well, that's verse eight. If you read about verse nine, he describes what the Holy Spirit's gonna do. About sin, because people do not believe in me. That makes sense. If you don't know you're a sinner, you won't need, know you need a savior. He's just letting people know, hey, you need a savior in your life. I mean, maybe you grew up like I grew up. I grew up in a denomination no, no, this is true. We, we thought, I was taught by my church and by my parents that if you go to this church, you'll go to heaven one day. I remember as a little kid, there were seven kids in our family. Remember we had those big, long station wagons with the wood panels? Remember some of you? Come on, 60 pluses, help me out here. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, big, long panels, you know? And I remember you, they had the seats that looked backwards. No one wanted to ever sit in those, you know? You get car sick. And we drive to church in that big station wagon, the wood panels. And I remember my dad saying, well, look at them, that church over there. Look at that church. Those poor souls don't even know they're going to hell because they're in the wrong church. You know, and we didn't know. And because about sin, because some people don't know they need a savior. Number two, our first Corinthians 12 says this, but no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He'll draw you to that. Verse 10, about righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can no longer see me. The Holy, your friend will remind you that you are righteous. Because how many know when you sin and when you make a mistake, the last person you want to go talk to is God. He's the one you need to go to the most. He said, I'm, you can no longer see me. I need to remind you that you're not just saved. You're sons and daughters of God. That means you have 
boldness and confidence to go talk to God. And when you get a bad report from the doctor, I mean, that righteousness to rise up on the inside of you and say, no, God's not doing this. I'm delivered. I'm set free. Jesus is my healer. He's the great physician. You know, that's, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit will remind you of. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a, a boldness and a confidence that you belong in God's family, not because of how great you are, but because how great your big brother Jesus is. You know, one of my kids up in my office here in the, this building, um, the, I do staff meetings in there, lead meetings, and um, there's a couch and a chair, and, and uh, my desk is over here, and I was in a pretty intense meeting a few years ago. I mean, it was really sort of intense, and we were going over some pretty important information. There was a lot of personality in that room, and, um, and so anyways, one of my kids just walks in, opens the door, looks over, and just walks in, hey, hey, everybody. Walks over to my desk, opens the drawer, gets a piece of gum, puts it in his mouth, says, I'm just getting gum, see you guys, and just walks right out, shuts the door. And everyone's just standing there like, what it just happened? Can I tell you what just happened? Not my employee, not my friend, but my son came in his dad's office. Because you know why? He had right standing with me. Now, we talked about timing a little bit later, but what I'm talking about is this. There's something about sonship and the Holy Spirit wants to, because you know why? Because you no longer can see Jesus. You're going to have to be reminded of this. Number three, and about, and about judgment. Well, I think we missed this one. Because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Well, Jesus is going to talk about what that judgment means. In John 12, he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. The third thing the Holy Spirit, your best friend, will remind you of, it's really important, is your authority as, believers, as sons and daughters of God. Because you have an enemy, and he only has one tool in his toolbox. One. You know what it is? Deception. He's a, he's a liar. Jesus said he's the father of all lies. He deceived Adam and Eve. He is a deceiver. And, the, and Jesus said, hey, you got a best friend, the Holy Spirit, that will remind you of your authority. He'll remind you of really who you are. And so when the enemy comes and whispers in your vo in, 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 with his voice in your ear, you can say, no, I, no, this is what the Bible says. Satan, I take authority over you and your beauty. And watch. Guys, I, I know you're looking at me like, are you serious? I'm serious, everybody. You have authority as sons and daughters of God. Come on, I'm not afraid of the enemy. He's afraid of me. I'll tell you a story. Don't count this against my time because it's a good story. I didn't tell first service this. I was in Africa once and um, I was opening a Bible school there. I was sent, I mean, I was on staff at the ministry that was and my job was to always go ahead of time and do the big grand openings and, and meet with pastors. And so there's a bunch of pastors there. And, and so and when I got there, one of the, I heard through some of the students were talking about how in the middle of the night, these demons would come and they would drag people out of their beds. It was a real thing like in these villages and stuff. And so I got up, and I, I don't forget what I was preaching about, but I got up and I said, you know, I heard about this, and I double dog dare the devil to try to drag me out of my bed. And they just all stared at me. And they said, what? and after, so we had breaks, all lined up with me. And they says, now, pastor, this is real. This is real. You ought not be talking that way because you don't want to make the devil mad. And I, to which I responded to him, you, the devil doesn't want to make me mad. Because you know why? He's, he's been cast out. I'm part of the family of God, everybody. We don't need to be afraid of him. Let me wrap it up. I won't charge that against your time. I, I'm done now. Second Corinthians, this is the last verse. It said, the amazing grace of the master, the beautiful benediction that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the last thing he ever said to their church that you would experience the amazing grace of the master, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. Notice this language, beautiful, that would be with you, with all of you. I think we need to remind ourselves is that God the Father loves me. Like that's what he said. Of all the things I shared with you, Second Corinthians is a very intense book. A lot of theology in there. A lot, of, a lot of things were happening in that church. And he said, let me just remind you what's the most important thing, that you know God the Father loves you. And you know, honestly, I, 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 Dean and I, we, we, love, we love this church and we love you. 
And we, we care deeply about you. In fact, we have, this is the truth, we have to discipline ourselves on our date nights not to talk about you. We have a rule. We can't talk about you. Because we would talk about you, we think about you, pray about you every day. And I love you. I, I'm just gonna let you know, I think about you every day. I love you and I pray for you every day. But I, I draw the line here. I don't love you enough to give up one of my kids for you. That's the truth. I mean, I really love you a lot. But if it came down to me losing my family or serving you, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm picking the family. I'm just like, it, let, me, let me help you out. I already made that decision a long time ago, so there's no decision to make. If you asked me to give up one of my kids for, the, for you, ah, a lot of you I might. Some of them on certain days I might trade them in. <laughs> but not in my right mind, I'm not going to. But here, I need, I need you to know something. God the Father, he did that. He didn't just say it, he did it. He said, it's really important for you to know that God the Son saves me. God the Father loves me, but Jesus saved me. And that's, that's a big deal. Because what, what set this up, guys, is not just him coming to this earth. There's a lot of talk about that. Not just him leaving heaven where there's streets of gold and mansions and no sin, sickness, none of that. But he came to earth, and that's a pretty big deal. But the truth of the matter is, he lived on this earth for 33 years without sinning once. And can I just tell you something? He gave up some marvelous opportunities to sin. I always joke and say, I read about, I'm in the Gospels right now. That's my private devotion right now. And I read about his staff, and sometimes I get frustrated with our staff. I, I, I've been thinking lately, Lord, thank you for our staff. I'm glad I didn't have the 12 disciples as mine. Jesus did all that. He didn't sin once. People accused him of vile things, and he didn't sin once. First time he ever preached to people, they tried to throw him off a cliff. He did it, he did it without sinning. Come on, he made it to the cross, sin free. God the Son saves me. And number three is this, God the Holy Spirit is with me. God loves me. Jesus saved me. The Holy Spirit is with me.